Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. That was the only time I ever followed Elvis Presley or ever wanted to. I mean, he was, you know, I would never have followed Elvis again. Uh, he was my opening act, and I got away with that because they didn't know who he was. Well, at the time, you were, a, you know, you were a bigger <laughs> artist. Well, at that moment, yeah, but as it, that changed, and never did I ever want to follow him again. I'd be happy to be on the same stage, and perform, but not. Uh, I just take some secret pride in the fact that he was my opening act once. <laughs> did, you see, did, did he open for anybody else ever? That must have been one of the few people he's ever opened for. Or definitely, the f two other artists made the mistake <laughs> of having El after his first couple of hits, um, Liberace. All right, yeah. Liberace had Elvis as his opening act, and the trouble was after Elvis finished and left the stage, and the crowds didn't quit screaming. They wanted more Elvis. They didn't want Liberace. <laughs> And, and then the comedian, Jack, uh, George Burns, George Burns uh, made the mistake of having him open for him. And it won't surprise anybody to know that once Elvis finished, the fans wanted to follow him to wherever he was going, and <laughs> leaving the main attraction sort of on stage and uh, unnecessary. Well, it seems like it was quite a pleasant experience, though, you know, when he opened for you in the sense that it was, as you'd expect, you got a, a really good you know, reaction. It's not like he stole your thunder because it was that early on. Uh, yeah, I had the hits that night. He didn't. They didn't yeah. know who he was. They liked the way he looked. And on that second song, they liked the way he sounded. And he wasn't wiggling or anything. He wasn't doing that. That all developed later. <clears throat> but he was just standing there picking on his guitar and the two musicians and making the sound of the record that he had recorded. Uh, or that is mimicking it. He, they were just playing the record, <laughs> as I, as they did for me, when I sang Two Hearts, Two Kisses. The next record, in that was March of '55, was Two Hearts, Two Kisses. Then in uh, May, I had to have a new record, and I recorded Fats Domino's "Ain't That a Shame." You made me cry when you said goodbye. Ain't that a shame? And uh, that was a million and a half seller. He had sold about 150,000 as a number one R&B record. He wrote it. I recorded the same song my way in a rock and roll version, and uh, it sold a million and a half, ten times what his record had sold. And he said countless times after that, I made more money from Pat Boone's record of my song than my own record of it oh, because yeah. I sold ten times more records, and we were calling it rock and roll. And then when that night when I... Elvis opened for me. My current million seller was a lesser known, but still a million seller, called at my front door. Crazy little mama comma, knocking, knocking at my front door, door, door. And, uh, and that was becoming a million seller right then. <laughs> so Elvis was abashed and, um, and just shy. Uh, didn't know how, how we could continue a conversation. Well, he got over that, of course, but still, for his whole career. Uh, he was never comfortable in crowds. That's why he kept his buddy, I mean, that is when he wasn't performing, because he had his buddies all around him, musicians and his road guys yeah. around him, because he just was not comfortable standing, talking to people he didn't know. That's so interesting. And it seems very, um, you know, it seems like you've got much more, uh, you know, social confidence than what, what it sounds like 
he had, and a lot of stars are more comfortable on, on the stage. Well, well, Johnny Carson, our comedian, was like that. I really? Mean, yeah, oh, he, he, on, on camera, he was in his element, and he was funny and terrific for years. But going down the street, he would be shy and not, he would try to not be seen. Not because he didn't want to be recognized, but because he didn't want to stand. There was <laughs> one thing that happened once uh, in New York before he it was really quite as popular. He said a guy stopped him on the street. Wait a minute, I know who you are. I know who you are. He said, Johnny Carson. No. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> he, he was not sure it was Johnny Carson, but he knew he was somebody. But, but I guess because of things like that, he just wasn't. <laughs> He, he didn't want to uh, stand around talking to people he didn't know. Yeah, he didn't want, want the hassle. And yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's fair enough. And so, I mean, that whole story about Elvis, you know, it illustrates, you know, your longevity and also that you were f one of the first people um, and, and, you know, thir is it 38 top 40 yeah. hit singles? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I wanted to, one of the questions that I had on my mind was your thoughts about other kind of similar um, early pioneers of pop music and, 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 you know, rock and roll music. The first being another person who's been on this podcast um, who was not big here. He never broke America, but he was around the same time as Elvis and very Elvis obsessed. So he came after you and he came after Elvis, but Cliff Richard. Cliff Richard. Yeah. I thought you were going to yeah. say Cliff. Listen, he and I became very good friends. And so much so that because he and I were doing some of the same things, sometimes recording some of the same songs. Uh, he, he said he, he referred to himself as the, uh, as the British Pat Boone, and I called him uh, the English Pat Boone. Yeah, there's, there's uh, some similarity, but you, I guess, you know, you were I first. mean, I call myself the American Cliff Richard. <laughs> I, I, got, I did that backwards. I, was, I, I call myself in his presence at least the uh, uh, American Cliff Richard. Because we were two young guys, uh, we were both Christian guys, we were, he wasn't married, I don't know if he ever got married. No, I don't think he did. But, uh, poor guy. <laughs> but I was married and having kids while I was a teen idol. I yeah. was just barely out of my own teens. But when I graduated from Columbia University uh, at, in 1958, um, with I was already doing a, my own network television music show and all the big artists coming on and Ella Fitzgerald, Sammy Davis, Nat Cole, and, and including some of the rock artists, uh, two, uh, Little Richard and Fats coming on my show, making movies in the summertime. Uh, and, and I graduated Magda Cum Laude with honors, Columbia University in 1958, with four children. Already, my wife and I married at 19, and when I graduated at 23, with honors, with all this other stuff happening, we had four kids. And so, to be a teen idol with a wife and four kids, I don't think it's ever happened. No, very with, unusual. Before or since, but it was part of my image. But I was singing rock and roll. I was having big hits, you know, with Tutti Frutti eventually, and Long Tall Sally, and rip it up and all the other rock and roll songs and and making performances and and and, uh, and a acting like a teen idol and having the success of a teen idol and yet known by the kids that I had a wife and four little girls it, it was it very was different phenomenal I mean I just don't know how it happened it just ha I just say it was a God thing I he meant for me to have this kind of uh, success and appeal uh, because what he thought and, and believed I would do with it. <laughs> yeah, well, you've, you've always, you know, faith seems to have always been so important to you and, and your marriage. And there was one thing that I read that kind of illustrates the importance of your marriage and your faith. Um, but I wanted to find out whether it was true because you mm. can't believe yeah, some stuff yeah. that you read on the Internet these yeah. days. Was it true that you turned down a movie with Marilyn Monroe? Yep. Because of, you know, you were, you were kind of concerned about the impression it would give. Well, it's a story. Let me tell you yeah. li what literally happened. First, my first movie, there was no kissing. 
I signed a seven movie picture deal, so I was going to make at least one movie a year for seven years. I did more than that. But the, the first movie, there was just a bunch of teenagers, and it was a made-up girl that we were all in love with called Bernadine. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the second was April Love, and with a real live female co-star, Shirley Jones. There was no kiss in the script, so I had not discussed with my wife, Shirley, how she was going to feel if I went to the studio and spent half the day kissing my, my uh, co-star. And so when the director, while we were filming April Love, said, now I want you to kiss Shirley when this song ends, I said, on the mouth? He said, yes. I said, well, wait, uh, this was not in the script. He said, no, but this is the perfect place. You've got to kiss your leading lady. I said, well, can we do it a little later in the film? Just because I haven't talked to, I know this was naive, but I haven't talked to my own wife, Shirley, about how she's going to feel about me kissing these other actresses. So can we do it later so I have a chance to talk to my wife first? Well, okay, but this was a perfect place for you to kiss your leading lady. When I saw the film later, I agreed with him. I should have kissed Shirley Jones at that place and maybe two or three other times. But I went home and I talked to my wife, Shirley. She said, I'm way ahead of you. I know you've got a seven-year movie deal. You're going to be doing some kissing. I just want you to promise me one thing. I said, what? You won't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I promise. I won't enjoy it. So I came back to the studio ready to do the kissing with Shirley Jones. But... The story hit our trade papers, the, the industry papers, all over, wire services, movie actor won't kiss his leading lady. They assumed for religious reasons. And I kept trying to say when I got a chance to talk about it, no, not religious reasons. I just wanted to stay married. Yeah. And my wife gave me permission as long as I wouldn't enjoy it too much. But by then, literally telegrams and Phone calls and letters were flowing into 20th Century Fox. Stick to your guns, boy. At last, there's some guys in the movies with morals, so stick. Don't, don't kiss the leading lady, which was ridiculous, of course, but I was stuck with it. So I didn't kiss Shirley Jones that first movie because it, it, would, have made, it would have looked like it was not the case, but that I had some religious scruple about it which was not the case, but that after talking to the director, I just scrapped my, my religious conviction and, and kissed her anyway. So I didn't kiss Shirley Jones in the movie, but I did kiss Anne Margaret and a, and, a, and a number of other actresses, So, and with my wife's permission, as long as I wouldn't enjoy it too much. However, with Marilyn Monroe, uh, when, they, when the, direct, the producer, the executive of a 20th Century Fox, Buddy Adler, said, we're going to put you with Marilyn Monroe. It's going to be a huge success. It's a film, a story about a young guy that gets involved with this slightly older but still beautiful cabaret singer. And there's a, an affair that takes place between the two in the small town that she comes, where she comes to get her bearings and decide if she's going to keep on touring and traveling like that. And, uh, and I said, uh, Mr. Adler, I can't do this f script. I'd read the script, and it was going to involve an affair, a real illicit affair, which would break the boy's heart when she left. But, it, but he'd get over it and have that sweet memory of the affair he had with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> and I said, I can't do it. He said, why? I said, I've, I, I've got millions of teenage fans, and, and I'm not asking them to follow my example, but they do. And I said, if, if I, Pat Boone, apparently have an illicit affair with Marilyn Monroe, what young kid with the blood flowing through his veins wouldn't want to do that himself and imagine himself in that situation? I, I just can't do it. He said, well, this is medieval. He said, uh, this, is, this is an acting part. That's all. You're not, you're not that guy. You're, I said, but I am portraying that guy. And I said, I'm sorry. I said, you do what you have to do, but because uh, he said, you know, we could suspend you. I said, well, I just have to follow my own conscience. I, I didn't get into this, this particular situation. I didn't ask to be proposed to do a, a movie like this. With, I'd love to make a movie with Marilyn Monroe, but not this story. Mm. So reluctantly, he got somebody else. They did somebody else to do that story 
with uh, Joanne Woodward and Richard Beamer from West Side Story, and it was a flop. The movie was a bomb. It went no place. It, it would probably have gone well because of the sensationalism if it had been me and Marilyn, but instead they put me into a film called Journey to the Center of the Earth. And that did very well, didn't which it? Which became a multi-million seller, a huge box office smash, and um, in fact, they told me later it saved 20th Century Fox because they, they were in trouble with Cleopatra, the filming of Cleopatra with Richard Burton and, and Elizabeth Taylor. And you know, there'd be days or a week where Taylor and Burton would disappear, go to Spain and pursue their romance and leave uh, 500 extras in Italy with their costumes waiting. And the bankers were getting fed up with it and they were about to foreclose on 20th Century Fox when Journey to the Center of the Earth came out and did such box office success, which I wouldn't have made if I had done the Marilyn Monroe film. So it just confirmed to me that I, I was right in making um, conscientious decisions that I've tried to make in my career about music, about movies, about TV, everything. Uh, just try to, to be what I, I think is moral for me, not for everybody necessarily, but for me. Yeah, you're not trying to say to everybody, this is how you have to behave. No. But, and, you know, it's fair enough. A lot of people, for different reasons, say no to creative projects, yeah. whether they're movies, whether they're, they're albums. So you've, you've given your thoughts on, on Cliff Richard, and I thought, you know, you would have a, a friendship or oh, at least yeah, a relationship I, I, with I him. I loved him and admired him so, because, <clears throat> like, like me, he had some amazing staying power. He of course just kept he did, yeah. going year after year. Now, of course, it helped that he wasn't married so that young girls could have, um, you know, dreams about maybe getting with Cliff Richard forever, yeah. becoming his, his love, his wife or something. Never happened. But uh, me, I was married with four kids and responsibilities already. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, uh, always when you get the type of longevity that you've, you've both had, though, it, go, it goes beyond that. And yeah. I guess the, 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 next pers the, the next group or the next major figure in pop music and rock music, and the last one I kind of want to discuss, uh, your view on the Beatles, because oh. obviously they came along after you and Elvis and yeah. Cliff Richard. And what did you think of that time at that time that they came out? I flipped over the Beatles before they were hits in the States. I, in England, I was there touring and I heard this, I want to hold your hand. I, I want to hold your hand, which I eventually recorded myself. But later, I wanted to, I, when I came home from, the, from England, I brought their record with me and I tried to get Randy Wood of Dot Records to let me record that song. I love the way they did it. I love the song itself. And, uh, and I found them very exciting, but he wouldn't do it because it had already been released in the States and it, nothing happened with it. That particular first song, when it was first released, nobody knew them. They hadn't seen them. They just heard the sound as good as it was. But uh, so it, 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 it had not happened. And so they wouldn't let me record it. Later, once they did, uh, and, and just absolutely swept through the charts. And there was a time when half of the top 10 songs on the charts were Beatles songs. <laughs> and they were taking all the record royalties from me and Tom Jones and everybody else. I, I uh, and, and it was robbing me of record royalties and so on. So I got in touch with Brian Epstein, their manager. I had a painter friend I was supporting and he painted pictures of the Beatles beautiful portraits of the Beatles. And we went to Sears Roebuck stores and had prints made. And so and I, I sold Beatle pictures for a couple of years and made more money selling Beatle pictures than I was making from my own records. <laughs> and that led to the meeting when we had our only real meeting in per a person. When they hit the States with their, their first concerts, they were in Las Vegas. And I had, with these pictures, we had sold millions of Beatle pictures. And the, by the way, they are on display at the cave now as part of their early, <laughs> of their early record, of their oh. early uh, career. But um, the, we had had a national contest, numbered tags on every set of pictures that was sold. And then we had a drawing and brought 30 people to Las Vegas 
to the Beatles' first concert, and Shirley and I and the girls, I have pictures of us sitting on the front row uh, of the Beatle concert in the Thomas Mack Arena and uh, shooting past Ringo and the guys on stage and Shirley, me, and my four little girls on the front row. And then between the first show and the second, there were two shows that, that day and night. We visited backstage, and my daughter sat in the, the, the laps and talked with the four Beatles. I think daughter Laurie was in Ringo's lap, and daughter Cherry was talking to Paul, as was I. And um, Debbie, my daughter Debbie, with, with George. And um, who am I leaving out? Just, Paul, uh, John, John, I guess Lindy was talking to John. And so we had, we, had, we had some good visit there. They were looking at cameras. They had, had people out, go out and buy cameras so they could start taking pictures everywhere they went. And then we had a nice visit, and I told them about uh, the deal I had made with Brian Epstein, which they knew, and they said, Paul said to me, Brian put us into a bunch of crap, into all kinds of things that, with our names on them, but we like these pictures because you make us look good. <laughs> and so they liked those pictures. And so I was in Beetle, uh, in Beetle business briefly. That's, yeah, un unbelievable. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, so it seems that you were, you know, all of these other characters who came along and had, had an influence, you, you know, you, you appreciated their, their kind of talent. Yeah, you know, it didn't hit me till many years later that when I was having my initial success, people like Engelbert and the Beatles and, uh, and so many, well, Cliff, but others were very young and, and I was already hitting it and hitting it big. And later when I met Bono and, and Edge after one of the big meetings where they had won the uh, record of the year with, I think I still haven't found what I was looking for, they, but they were coming into a big, uh, party, press party, and I was walking behind Bono. So I, I said loud, he comes up to about here on me, and I said, <laughs> where he could hear me, I, I think it's time Buno met Bono. <laughs> and he turned around and he said, oh, hello, Pat. And there was he and Edge, and he said, we met before. You may not remember, and I didn't. When they were just getting started out of Dublin, they were in uh, London, and I was doing a concert, and we met. And he said, you know, you didn't know us then, but, but we knew you. And you were nice to us and encouraged us. And w weren't they originally considered at the very beginning like a, almost like a Catholic gospel group uh, when their first so so couple of songs mm -hmm. and then before they exploded as you too. But they had a different group. I used to know the name of it. But anyway, I, I, didn't act, I just acted like I remembered having met them but I didn't. But then we sat down and had a, a good visit, and uh, I told him I had just done a, written a song about Billy Graham, the evangelist, called Thank You, Billy Graham, which did become a, a, a nationwide, and at some points, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, universal kind of a hit across the world, Thank You, Billy Graham, with a multitude of artists. And I said, I'm putting together a group of people to pay tribute to Billy Graham. Would you be interested in being part of it? And he wrote his number out in his office in Dublin. And I called him, and he introduces, Bono introduces my record, Thank You, Billy Graham. And, uh, and so we've had these interactions. But Engelbert, he said he used to wear white buck shoes and sing my songs when he was coming up, when he was Jerry Dorsey. Wow. Before he was Engelbert, <laughs> and and it, I had not become aware until you know later, that <clears throat> while I was considering them huge stars, which they are and already were, they were looking at me like I've got pictures of John and Paul wearing Pat Boone fan club buttons. That's amazing. And yeah. I can I can let you see them if you that if would, you'd like. That you would can be. have them if you want but they were both wearing Pat Boone fan club buttons. Well, I mean, I, that's what, that's what I, I thought, and I was you know, really interested in your take on these um, yeah. artists because you, know, you preceded them. Uh, another thing that I wanted to share with the listenership uh, who don't know, because some people will, mm -hmm. is that, you, correct me if I'm wrong, you've recorded 2,600 roughly songs, which is obviously... It's, it's you about 2,700 2,700. I just can't quit. I just keep going. 
Yeah, Frank Sinatra recorded some 1,500. Bing Crosby was my early role model, a balladeer, really. All he could sing anything, and that's why I liked him so much. But he recorded some 2,000 songs. But I've recorded almost 2,700 separate songs. And, and, and in so many genres, country, rock, heavy metal, patriotic, two a cappella albums with no instrumental music, and of course pop, big band, swing, heavy metal. I mean, I've just, I, that's what I love to do. I love to, I like uh, live performing. I've always enjoyed that very much, especially if people were liking my songs. But recording them to begin with is what, is what has captivated the, me the most, going in a studio, recording songs, beautiful songs, any kind of songs that I really liked, <clears throat> and knowing that they are permanent. I mean, for better or worse, they will live longer than me. They may not always be popular. Maybe some of them were popular and many weren't. But they were albums and things that I believed in, and uh, many of them, to my great surprise, in several genres have been big, big hits. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, we've already talked about you singing rock and roll and covering songs, you know, by kind of rhythm and blues artists like mm -hmm. Fats Domino. Your latest uh, album is called uh, Country Jubilee. And yeah. I wanted to share <laughs> the uh, vinyl. I uh, used to look like important. that. Well, I thought I could see some resemblance here, but you say that there is none. Though. Well, and I'm sitting here, this thing blousing out like I'm a big fat toad. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, uh, I've always kept in good shape, worked out in the gym. In fact, that's how I hurt my, my leg, but I'm recovering from it. Well, you, just three weeks after you hurt your leg, uh, you, you were on the Huckabee Show performing yeah. a song that you wrote. Um, a single called Grits. Yes. So for those people in the UK, because you know your manager Dana kindly it was just checking whether I knew what Grits uh, yeah. were, because obviously I'm from from the UK. Yeah. Uh, what inspired you to write about Grits? Well, Grits in the Southeast US and now across the country, and really much more popular across the country than it ever was. Right now, Grits is like it's like uh, cream of wheat. It's really like cream of corn. That, that's a way to describe it. It's a, it's, but it's it's a, a mashed potato type thing, but it's mashed tiny bits of corn, and it goes with anything. You can, it has not a big flavor itself, but then it's a complement to eggs and ham and meat and shrimp. Now shrimp and grits across the U.S. is very popular now. So grits, I grew up eating grits, and it's a country thing. It's it more identified with uh, with country and being corn. And corny, mm. and so I dreamed it. I, I dreamed that I was having a big country hit record, which really hadn't happened for years. It had been only one or two times that I had country hits. Though I am a country guy. You're from Nashville, aren't Nashville. you? Nashville. Grew up in Nashville. Milked the camp family cow when I was in high school, and I would bring the milk in and get ready and go to school and sit next to the girl I was going to marry. Eventually, Shirley Foley. Uh, but I was a country guy, yeah. And uh, then I became a rock and roller and a movie actor and all these other things. So now I dreamed I had a country hit, and I came out of the dream with the first verse, which I think God wrote because it was a dream. Grits, grits, bestest food there is, country caviar, Tennessee foie gras, hey, grits, <laughs> grits, bestest food there is. Keep your fancy food, give me my grits. And then I make fun of escargot, them snails have got to go. Pate, what is that anyway? All these hors d'oeuvres that, that are served when you're waiting around in, in a reception or something and they bring you little stuff on plates. Well, what is all of that? And, and I said, bring me some grits. And, uh, and it became a, uh, became a hit just almost overnight. And uh, so that's why we have it on the album. And they even created in this country a grits line dance. Line dancing is a very popular thing in the States where people, um, they have routines that they all do together and they move their feet and they twist and they turn and they in a line. And I can't do it, but, uh, and I tried to do it in the video. <laughs> and you can tell that I can't do it. But they, but they created a grits line dance to go with this song, which meant they had to go on the internet and hear it over and over, and then they had had to play it 
to do the line dance to it. And almost right away, it became the number one line dance, <laughs> which helped my song Grits uh, immeasurably. Yeah, well, I loved the performance uh, of it uh, on Hockey Show, and unbelievable that you, you know, you were free to. I'm standing there with a broken hip while I sang it. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what what keeps you working, you know, as hard as you do? Because you've already achieved, you know, a lot of people would sort of say, you know, I've done quite a lot. Oh. I've recorded a lot of songs. I've had a lot of hits. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I can't I can't be bothered anymore. What gives you this drive? Or it's it's the love of singing. I mean, that was it from the beginning. Always, I didn't have any uh, vocal training. Uh, I just started singing with my brother. We do harmony in our family gatherings, and then in grade school, uh, and you know, up through up into high school, as we call it, <coughs> I would, uh, if there was ever any singing to be done, I would volunteer to do it. And then around Nashville on talent shows and so on, and then Amer uh, American national talent shows. I would just go on and sing for the fun of it. I was going to be a preacher teacher, I thought, because, uh, you know, being a singer was too iffy a thing, especially if you're married at 19, as I did. You better have a profession. <laughs> you can't uh, go out and be knocking on doors trying to be a pop singer. And, um, and so I was in school planning to be a school teacher when I won a national talent contest, and then that led to another one, and then the record contract, and the first record was a million seller, and then for from March of 55 to somewhere in late 1959, I was never off the single charts. It's a record I hold in the record business of four and a half years consecutively, week after week after week, without ever being off the single record chart, usually with two records one going down and one going up. That's the way our record company handled my releases. As soon as a record reached number seven, if it dropped to number 10, out came the next record. If uh -huh. it only went to number 30 and, and, and dropped to 40, out came the next record. So nobody else was thinking about it, nor were we, nor was I. But it's just later, when we checked the statistics, we found that nobody, no one else has ever had a, a string of, of uh, four and a half years without ever being off the single chart. Mm. Albums and then, and then pauses and then came the next, come the next records. So this, this was all unintentional. It's just me following the, my own inclination to sing and whenever I was offered the opportunity to sing or record or make a movie or whatever, I just did it. So now I've just finished making three films I play our American president, Thomas Jefferson, in one. It's called The American Miracle. And uh, while he was president, uh, they purchased, they made the Louisiana Purchase, bought Louisiana and all that territory from uh, Napoleon. And I play Thomas Jefferson in this movie. Another right. movie, I'm a retired golf pro helping um, a young um, would-be billionaire uh, with his golf game, but also get his life back together. It has a, a gospel theme. The Mulligan is the name of the film, and that's a second chance, a do-over. If you miss a shot, you ask your partners, can I, can I have a mulligan? Can I hit that again? I think I can do it better. If they're willing to let you do it, they call it a mulligan. And so this movie is about a, this guy needing a start over in his life, and I'm the old golf pro that's helping him in this film and it's got uh, awards in Canada and I got best actor award in the uh, in that film for inspirational film so it's just the opportunities keep coming hmm. I was about to do another live performance of concert uh, about two two nights two days before uh, I mean after I broke my hip and of course I had to cancel but now we're reprogramming I'm going to be going back to live performing Wow. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, I just I love doing it. And as long as I can keep doing it and people want to hear or see me do it, <laughs> why not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very, very inspiring. So Country Jubilee, can you tell us what, you know, the reasons were to, behind recording these songs? Because a lot of these are, are very well-known songs. And, and where did you record it? I recorded a lot of them in Nashville, but in some cases, because it was over a course of of about 40 years of recording. 
I was recording other places and I would do uh, country songs, but with generally country feelings to them because they were country songs. But most of them in Nashville at various times when I would be home at what I call my original home in Nashville, in the house where I grew up. It's still in the Boone family, and whenever I'm in Nashville, I don't stay in a motel or a hotel. I, I sleep in the house where I grew up wow. from the time I was four years old. I mean, uh, I'm reluctant to give up something good once, <laughs> once I've got it. So all the country songs I was recording through the years, uh, when, when grits happened, and I realized I've re I have recorded more country songs uh, along the way than some prominent country artists in my albums. I mean, there's many, many more than are in this album. But we just picked some of what we thought were 25 of the best ones, all million sellers. And nobody's ever done this because country artists don't record each other's songs. Uh, but i not considered a country artist, but now I surely am because I record the, in that album 21 huge hits by Frank, by uh, Hank Williams, July, uh, Jambalaya, and Kalijah, and Your Cheating Heart, and Eddie Arnold's uh, Make the World Go Away, and uh, George Jones, He'll Have to Go, and just, and then there's a, a new, newer uh, version of But It's a Million Seller with Crystal Gale, mm. her song, Just You and I, she did with Eddie Rabbit years ago. And she wanted to make a new record. She and her husband wanted her to record it again, but Eddie was gone. So they asked me to record it with her, and I did. And so it's in the album, another million seller that we've recorded in just the last year or so. And then the uh, Grits in the last year and a half. And now a new one, which is we, it's too late to put it in this album, but a new record that's already on the country charts. Both those songs, Just You and I, and Grits are big on the country charts all over America. But... Uh, and on Syria, you know, Sirius XM and Spotify and Pandora and all of them. But I've just released a new record called uh, My Stupid Tattoo. Yeah, I, I heard that. And it's, have you heard it already? Yes, I have. <laughs> what, what, what was, was that song that you wrote, right? I, I didn't write it. No, my musical conductor wrote it with a friend, but I recorded it. And I reworked the lyric a little bit because <clears throat> the way they wrote it first, the tattoo was on the guy's buttock. <laughs> and I changed it. I said, no, it's on his neck. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and so it's, a, it's already, it was just recent, in the last week or so, uh, number six, new freshly added chart record on the country charts added to the new play, new hit records or new hit songs or new songs. Huh? I, don't, I don't know what they call it. Anyway, the number six on the fr freshly added songs on country charts. When you're in a recording studio, because you know, you've recorded 2,600 songs, ha has, has the way that you record vocals changed at all? And has the process changed? And do, do you go in and you literally think, this is the easiest thing in the world now. I'm going to be in and out in you know, 20 <laughs> minutes and then I'm off for lunch. Or, or, or are you quite kind of painstaking about the process? Oh, well, well, uh, it, so much depends on the kind of song it is. <clears throat> whether I find it easy and just a good luck, happy, happy-go-lucky thing to do to sing it, or I've done hymn albums, and one that I think, if I dare say it, is the best hymn album ever, called Songs from the Inner Court. And the Bible talks about our being able, uh, as believers and saved people, uh, welcomed by God to come into His inner court and sing to Him or worship Him. And so, in this songs from the inner court, boy, it was <clears throat> a very meticulous, worshipful, spontaneous in my singing. But I mean, it's a incredibly beautiful album. But then so many other songs are uh, more demanding. I mean, the songs from the, the theme from Exodus, which it was already a big instrumental hit internationally. The theme from the movie Exodus with Paul Newman about the reestablishment of um, Israel in 1948. Uh, God had said he would bring the people of Israel back together again and Israel would exist again. And in 1948 it was born, but it was not without warfare and battle and all kinds of, uh, of, of strife. But Harry Truman, our president then, did side with uh, the new nation and, 
and America stood with Israel back then. And so the movie uh, had a song in it written, composed by Ernest Gold. Bum, 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 bum. And I wanted to sing that melody, but there were no words. So it was a Christmas Eve. We'd been told by the publisher there would be no words because, you know, try to compress two, three thousand years of history into one short melody was a task. And even prominent writers had tried submitted lyrics, but three different people, Ernest Gold, the composer of the melody, uh, Chapel Music, the owner of the song, and Otto Priminger, the director producer of the film, all had a veto power and when the lyrics would be proposed and they might be cluttered and difficult trying to cram into that melody, they say, no, no, those aren't the words. No, no, just let it be an instrumental. And so the music publisher said, there won't be any lyrics, it'll just remain an instrumental. I couldn't take that. Mm -hmm. I just had to sing that song. So in late 59, it's Christmas Eve really, uh, when uh, Shirley, my wife, was trying to get me to quit playing that Ferrani and tie shirt instrumental, bum, 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 uh, bum, 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 and, and she said, Pat, please quit playing that record. Help me get the presents under the tree so we can go to sleep. <laughs> uh, one more time, honey, just one more time, and I put the needle, bum, 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 and words popped in my head, this land is mine. Bum, 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 ba bum, God gave this land to me. I mean, it just came like that. It's like I took dictation, and in 20 minutes, I just played the instrumental over until I got the whole melody, and in, and in 20 minutes, I wrote the lyrics, which were then immediately accepted by the composer, by the publisher, by Otto Preminger, and I recorded it, and it became... This land is mine, God, until I die, this land is mine. It's a declaration by one person, not trying to tell 3,000 years of history. Uh, you know, the, the walls of Jericho and coming across, and Egyptian captivity, and, you know, that's 40 years in the desert. I mean, it's too much history to cram into if you're going to try to tell it. Mm. But no, this the personal declaration of one Israeli. And of course, I knew that women fought long, alongside the men, sabras, they call them. So the second part, so, so take my hand and walk this land with me, this brave, this golden land with me. So two people, and if I must fight, I'll fight to make this land our home. Until I die, this land is mine. And it was, so now I was at the Holocaust Museum about four years ago. In, in Israel. I'd been there before and I was there with Mike Huckabee and we were we hosting a tour group and uh, I didn't want to go through the Holocaust. Everybody ought to go through once to see to because there's still people who try to say that the Holocaust didn't happen. It, it, it just idiocy. History shows it did but they ought to see what inhumanity people can be capable of. So I'd been through it and I'm sitting out there with my wife, Shirley, waiting for the tour group to come through. And up walks this big, strong fellow who is one of the executives of the Holocaust Museum at Yad Vashem. And he had tears in his eyes. He said, you don't know what those words you wrote mean to us here in Israel and at the Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. And I said, Shia, that's his name, Shia Ben Yehuda. I think I do. I read the Bible every year cover to cover. For at that point, 45 years, it's now about 40, 46 years, 48 years. And um, I said, I do know the whole history, and I know what it means to you. And I, I, I said, I'm glad that it means that to you. He says, well, you must have written those words somewhere when you wrote them. I said, oh, yeah. Would you be willing to let us have that to put on the wall of the righteous Gentile, along with Corey Ten Boom and with uh, Oscar Schindler, and those Christians who supported Israel during the Holocaust, supported the Jews. I said, well, yes, I would let you have it right now, but I need to let you know. I wrote those words on the back of a Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, more, more the better. He said, because we know you evangelical Christians are our strongest supporters in the world. If it weren't for you right now, we would have trouble existing. 
because you support us. I said, yeah, we identify with you. We know that everything we believe uh, about Jesus, who was Jewish, by the way, he was the Jewish Messiah, and uh, the Old and New Testaments are all written by Jews, about Jews, for Jews, about the little country named Israel, about from whom would come a Savior for the world, a Jew named Jesus. And we Gentiles could get in on it if we accepted the Jewish Messiah. We know how Jewish the whole thing is. And so we identify with you. And, uh, and of course, he was really teared up at that point. So was I. And now I've been back and we had a ceremony with the military and government people and, yeah. uh, and, and so, uh, giving the framed Christmas card with the words to Exodus on display at the, uh, on the wall of the righteous Gentile at the Holocaust Museum. Well, that, that's an amazing story. And also it's, uh, it's, you know, for somebody who's such a proud Christian, it's very heartwarming to hear oh. of, uh, you know, friendships between two yeah. distinct dip, different religions, obviously, with, with links. And really I, I the wanted... same religion. We don't re we're coming to realize it now, that Christianity is totally Jewish. Mm. Well, as, as, as you pointed <laughs> out, grew you know, Jesus was a Jew. out of historic Judaism. And, and you, you've written this book, and I wanted to uh, f finish off by asking you about this, because this is, you know, the greatest music of all time podcast. So we were talking about rock and roll. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're a published author, not, not once, but you also wrote a book in the 60s, I think. Oh, in, in, in 58. 58. 58 and 9, I was a... Uh, Twix 12 was a and 20. Twix 12 and 20. A, a teen, see, I was asked by a secular publisher to write a book of moral advice. I was still in college. I was making movies and records uh, and, and doing TV, but I was still trying to get my degree for, to be a teacher at Columbia University. And they said, write a book of moral advice for kids. I thought, well, that's what I was going to do as a teacher. So I did. I wrote this book, you know, thoroughly Bible-based, but just practical advice for teens. I mean, what you write about for teens then, you know, be clean, be polite, be kind to others, um, you know, uh, get your, do your studies and make good grades and, you know, date, yes, but, you know, be home by 11 o'clock, you know, just good practical advice for kids. And they, they wanted to call it Pat, uh, Pat talks to teens. I said, oh, no, no, that sounds very presumptuous. I'm barely out of my own teens. And so <clears throat> I, I want to call it Twix 12 and 20. Well, what's that mean? I said, what's, what's between 12 and 20? Oh, the teens. Well, okay. But it, <laughs> it's hard to say. I said, it's not hard to say. Twix 12 and 20. I like the alliteration. Sounds, I was an English major. So I like the alliteration Twix 12 and 20. And so that book, I had no idea that it would sell, but I just did it because they asked me to. And I dedicated any proceeds that might come from the sale of that book to a startup Christian college in Villanova, Pennsylvania. And a, a, an estate had been given to some Christians and they were going to create a new school, a college. And so I said, well, any money that might come from this book you can have. Well, the book became the number one nonfiction bestseller for two years in this country. And then it was translated into other languages. It sold millions of copies, both hardcover and softcover. And I'm still in college myself. Huh. And then the money was about a million and a half last time I heard about it. And it helped build that college. So now I graduated in 1959 from, from uh, I think it was late 58, but uh, from Columbia University, and my wife and I have decided to move to California. So we stopped in Villanova to see where the money has gone from the uh, book. And there's this uh, uni uni college growing, and the main building, the administration building, was the estate that, of the family that gave them all the property. And they had chiseled on the wall, the, the, uh, over the door into the main building, Boone Hall, and they na they named the main building after me, and I'm just out of college, wow. and I've written a million selling best book for, best selling book for teens. Well, that was the first of many other books. And why did you decide and, to write this book? If the eternal choice we must all make. Well, uh, yes, uh, 
and it's called if because I consider it the most important word in the Bible. It's there more than almost any other word except and and to, you know, just some conjunctions. But if, the most important word, starting in the book of Genesis all the way to the end in Revelation in the New Testament, if every blessing of God comes with an if, he wants to bless us with everything that God has, if we want it, if we will accept it, if we want he, what he's been trying to do since the beginning of time as we know it, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and his appeal to humankind, uh, he wants a family, he wants kids who like their daddy, <laughs> who want to be like their father. And that was the case with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he gave them everything in absolute perfection, said, I'll show you how it all works. I'll come around in the afternoon and show you how. And you, you can name the animals, Adam, and things like this. And they, they had this perfect, idyllic situation. He says, and it'll stay like this if I just don't want you to eat that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden because you don't need to know about evil. There is no evil yet. You don't need to know about good and evil, but don't eat just that one thing. Don't do that. If you do, you'll die. They did it. They died. And then <laughs> uh, from, from then on, ever since, every scripture of blessing comes with a, a specific or implied if. This is all yours. I want to give you everything. I want you to be my children. I want you to be my family. If you want me. Will you accept what I've done for you? Will you accept what I give you on my terms? Not just willy-nilly, you know, however you feel, but do you want to know what I would like of you? Uh, it, it's a relationship that he wants. And so I write on here, I say it's not religious. It's not a religion as such, a denomination or a made-up, uh, well-meaning religion. It's the if the eternal choice we all must make because in as we read the Bible or not, don't read the Bible, ignore the Bible or condemn the Bible or just, you know, just would go our merry way and know they may be a God, maybe not. But in this country, I don't know if it's the same in, in Great Britain. I expect it is that over half the population doesn't go to any place of worship anymore. Hmm. They may or may not pray. If they pray, they don't know this. Anybody listening? And if you say, well, when you die, you're going to go to heaven or hell. I don't know. Is there a heaven? Is there really a hell? I mean, they're spiritually and biblically ignorant, and yet it's the best-selling book every year since King James' time, way back when it got translated from, from Armenian, uh, not Armenian, but um, Greek, and, uh, and I'm thinking of the, uh, of the other Middle Eastern language and, and Hebrew. But uh, it all got in, into King James English. But it's, now it's this always, every year, the best-selling book in the world. So it's available anywhere, everywhere. Anybody wants to read it can read it and then find out who this one is who created everything mm -hmm. and who loves us enough to want to spend eternity with us if we desire that ourselves. And so that word, if, is so important, and I hoped it would grab the attention of the reader. It makes it look like it was pulled out of a book burning. The corners are singed, and even that little thing that says uh, not religious, just life or death, it looks like you pulled it out of a book burning, so it makes you want to read it. If what? Well, open it up and find out. <laughs> it's a very important book, very easy to read book. And, um, and of course, it's an autobiography in it, pictures, because I, I, um, I, know, I figure that people may be as ignorant about who I am as they are of the Bible. And, uh, and so they may want to know, well, who is this telling me that I need to read this book so I can decide for myself where I'm going to spend eternity? Well, I'm looking forward to reading it a lot. And I've really enjoyed talking to you, Pat. It's been a, a true honor and extremely interesting. So I'm thank sorry, you so much for coming much on. Say. <laughs> it's not been difficult to, to get you to talk, but it never is uh, usually too difficult. Occasionally, it's like getting blood out of a stone. But normally, uh, we have uh, very, very, uh, you know, guests who are interested in talking, and it's been like that today. So thanks so much for coming on the Greatest Music of All Time Listen, podcast, Pat. Thank you, Tom.
I want to recommend a quite extraordinary book called Shaggy Dog Memoirs, which came out on the 30th of November. It's written by John Lewis, who Debs and I had the privilege of meeting actually on a flight in America, and we got talking to him about his fascinating life. John has spent his whole life doing incredible things. He's had a long and glittering career, but his passion for the care and training of dogs is what made an impression on us and what he's written this book about. So after he was in the army and then subsequently traveled to places like Yemen, Norway, Canada, John began to focus on his love for dogs and his natural ability to train them to the best of their abilities. And this book explores this work and it's so funny and it illustrates his commitment to animals, to dogs, in a way that is going to resonate with any of you who own a dog. This book is absolutely wonderful. I couldn't recommend it more highly. Shaggy Dog Memoirs is available on Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, basically all good bookstores. Google it, Shaggy Dog Memoirs by John Lewis. This is going to be one of the books of 2024 and you've got to read it. Many of you are wondering why my skin looks so good right now and I can tell you the answer. I've been using products made by Olive and M. Olive and M are an incredible olive oil based skin company and their products contain natural plant based ingredients that were chosen for a specific reason to make your skin look better. Olive oil penetrates your skin quickly and easily healing it at its deepest level. Olives are a powerful antioxidant and they protect and repair against damaging free radicals. Olives stimulate skin regeneration, allowing your skin to look refreshed on a daily basis. And olive oil balances skin's own oil production, naturally reducing oily spots. I cannot tell you how much my skin has improved since I started using Olive and M's products. Go to oliveandm.com. The world has changed. Health is our most precious asset. This pandemic has highlighted the need of technology for humanity to survive. Billions of data are generated. This is the key to find cures for all diseases. There is no easy way for doctors to use it. Sharing medical data is challenging. We always fear an intruder could come in and destroy everything. But now, Galleon reveals the power of a new innovation, blockchain. Innovators around the world can fight together, eradicate cancer, prevent pandemics, cure obesity and diabetes, stop orphan diseases, there is no limit to human progress. Galeon is connecting blockchain to the medical knowledge, creating a new world where hospitals and patients are connected together in a secure and transparent way. Thanks to blockchain, patients have the control of their own data. They can choose to share it in a secure way for the good of humanity. It's time to be part of this new revolution. Join us now. I wanted to finish off by recommending the computer game Shadows Over Loathing to you. This is a slapstick figure comedy adventure RPG full of mobsters, monsters and mysteries. Your Uncle Murray has requested your aid at his antique shop in Ocean City, but upon your arrival, the old man is nowhere to be found. Your investigation into his disappearance and the artifacts he's been collecting takes a turn when you stumble across some shadowy plots and a bunch of squirming eldritch tentacles that threaten to bring about the end of the world. Explore a sprawling, open world chock full of danger, quests, puzzles and stick figures in this single-player comedy adventure RPG set in the Prohibition era of the Loathing Universe. 
See how many enemies you can stuff into a phone booth as the athletic pig skinner. Control the curds and way of the cosmos as the cunning cheese wizard, or march to the beat of your own inscrutable purposes as the hip jazz agent. Shadows Over Loathing is a brilliant game made by our friends at Asymmetric, who of course made Kingdom of Loathing and West of Loathing. Before it, I could not recommend this more highly. This episode is also brought to you by Pestege de Belém. At the beginning of the 19th century in Belém, Portugal, next to the Geronimo's Monastery, there was a sugarcane refinery attached to a small general store. As a result of the 1820 liberal revolution, all convents and monasteries in Portugal were shut down in 1834. The clergy and the laborers were all expelled. So in an attempt at survival, someone from the monastery offered sweet pastries for sale in the shop, pastries that rapidly became known as Pestege de Belém. Now these are absolutely delicious and they're still on sale at the Pestege de Belém store and cafe. This is a must visit spot. They are mind blowingly delicious and you can go to pestegedebelém.pt online to check out their website. This is a must visit establishment. As some of you might already know, my beloved mother is Portuguese. She comes from Lisbon. And so it is my great honor and privilege to say that this episode is brought to you by Lucifile. Launched in June of 2017, Lucifile is a Portuguese lifestyle brand that sources top quality homeware, clothing, gifts and accessories. And they're exclusively focused on Portuguese products. I cannot tell you how much I love Portugal and the artisanship and craftsmanship in Portugal is second to none. Many of these items are handmade by small independent teams and artisans or family run businesses and there's nowhere like Portugal. So go to lucifile.co.uk and browse their amazing products. I cannot recommend Lucifile more highly.